In this video, we're going to cover the structure of membranes and how their two primary components, lipids and proteins, are organized. We're going to be focusing on the plasma membrane, but most of what we're going to cover also apply to internal membranes, the membranes around organelles, including the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi, and mitochondria. So by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to identify each of these structures and understand their importance. Let's get started. All cells are bounded by a selective barrier called the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. The plasma membrane separates a cell from its surroundings, protects its chemical components from the outside environment, and prevents the content of the cell from mixing with other molecules in the surrounding environment. But the plasma membrane is capable of much more. It must also allow nutrients to enter the cell and waste products to exit for the cell to grow and survive. To carry out these processes, there are selective channels and transporters that allow small and specific molecules and ions to be imported and exported. Okay, there are also other proteins in the membrane that function as sensors or receptors, allowing the cell to receive information about any changes in its surroundings and react to them appropriately. Absolutely incredible. Now, like we mentioned before, all cell membranes, regardless of where they are found, are made of lipids and proteins and have a similar overall structure. The plasma membrane consists of a double layer or bilayer of phospholipids with various proteins embedded in it. This lipid bilayer acts as a permeability barrier to most water-soluble substances, while the proteins buried within it carry out the various tasks of the membrane and give each membrane its unique properties. So now let's subtract complexity and take a closer look at this lipid bilayer. Okay. Compounds that are classed as lipids are hydrophobic or water-fearing, which means they do not mix well with water. And cells are filled with and surrounded by water. So the structure of the cell membrane is determined by the way membrane lipids react in an aqueous environment. In cell membranes, the lipids are the phospholipids, which have a hydrophilic head or polar head that contains a phosphate group and two hydrophobic or non-polar hydrocarbon tails. Sometimes there are small polar molecules that is also linked to the phosphate group, such as choline. Now, polar simply means there is an electronegativity difference between the bonded atoms. Electronegativity is the ability of the atom to attract electrons more readily. The more electronegative the atom is, an atom is, the more strongly it attracts shared electrons toward itself. So polar molecules, the electrons are shared unequally and there are regions of slightly positive and negative, okay? So for example, this water molecule here, oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen and so it attracts electrons more readily than hydrogen. So the oxygen in a molecule of water has a slight negative charge, okay? Indicated by the Greek letter delta with a minus sign delta minus, while the two hydrogen atoms have a slight positive charge, delta plus. Now, with nonpolar, this means that the atoms share the electrons almost equally, all right? Hydrophilic molecules dissolve readily in water because they contain either charged or uncharged polar groups that can form hydrogen bonds with water molecules, whereas hydrophobic molecules are insoluble in water. We cover this in great detail in the Molecules and Chemical Bonds lecture. A phospholipid is an ampipathic molecule, meaning it has both a hydrophilic water-loving region and a hydrophobic water-fearing region. And this is important in organizing lipid molecules into bilayers. When phospholipids are added to water, they form a double-layered sheet called a bilayer that protects their hydrophobic tails from water. The hydrophobic parts are found in the interior of the membrane, while the hydrophilic regions are in constant contact with aqueous solutions on either side. Now, most membrane proteins are also ampipathic. These proteins can be found in the phospholipid bilayer with their hydrophilic portions projecting out. So a protein's hydrophilic parts are in contact with water in the cytosol and extracellular fluid, while their hydrophobic parts are in a non-aqueous environment. 
This arrangement is known as the fluid mosaic model. So the membrane is a mosaic of protein molecules within a fluid bilayer of phospholipids. So nothing prohibits membrane lipids from moving around and swapping places with one another within the plane of the membrane, despite the fact that the aqueous environment within and outside a cell prevents them from leaving the bilayer. These individual lipid molecules are able to move in their own monolayer. As a result, the lipid bilayer acts as a two-dimensional fluid, and it's also flexible. Now, for a cell membrane to function properly, its fluidity, which is the ease with which its lipid molecules move within and across the bilayer, must be maintained within specific limits. And how fluid a lipid bilayer is at a given temperature depends on the phospholipid composition of a lipid bilayer, specifically the structure of the hydrocarbon tails. The more regularly and closely packed the hydrocarbon tails are, the more viscous and less fluid the bilayer will be. Okay, so the length and quantity of double bonds in the hydrocarbon tails are the two main factors that determine how tightly they pack in the bilayer. Let's break this down. A shorter chain length minimizes the tendency of the hydrocarbon tails to interact with one another, increasing the bilayer's fluidity. And the tails, they vary in length. One of these hydrocarbon tails typically contains only single bonds between its adjacent carbon atoms, while the other tail may have one or more double bonds. The chain with a double bond is considered to be unsaturated in hydrogen, since it doesn't contain the full number of hydrogen atoms that may theoretically be connected to its carbon backbone. On the other hand, a saturated hydrocarbon tail contains a full complement of hydrogen atoms and no double bonds. So this is going to give a slight kink to the unsaturated tail created by each double bond, which makes it more difficult for the tails to pack against one another. And this explains why lipid bilayers with a high proportion of unsaturated hydrocarbon tails are more fluid than those with a lower proportion. In animal cells, the presence of cholesterol controls the fluidity of the membrane. This molecule is particularly abundant in the plasma membrane. So let's focus on the structure of cholesterol here and look at how it fits into the gaps between phospholipid molecules. Okay. There's a polar head group, a steroid ring structure, and a non-polar hydrocarbon tail. Now, because of the kinks in the unsaturated hydrocarbon tails of the adjacent phospholipid molecules, cholesterol may fill the spaces between them due to its short and rigid steroid ring shape. So again, we have the polar head, and this central portion is known as the cholesterol-stiffened region because cholesterol makes cell membranes more rigid, okay? And here is the more fluid region. Now, cholesterol has different effects on membrane fluidity at different temperatures. At moderate temperature, cholesterol reduces membrane fluidity by reducing the movement of phospholipids. And at low temperature, it prevents solidification by disturbing the regular packing of phospholipids. So cells that live at different temperature at different temperatures maintain their membrane fluidity by altering the lipid composition of their membranes. So for example, at 37 degrees, the body temperature of humans, cholesterol makes the membrane less fluid by restricting phospholipid movement. It makes it less flexible and permeable. Cholesterol resists the potential effects of temperature variations on membrane fluidity. Now, this is cool and all, but why is this important? Why is membrane fluidity important in all cells? Let's go through this. So first, it makes it possible for multiple membrane proteins to interact with one another and diffuse quickly across the bilayer, which is essential for processes like cell signaling. It allows membrane lipids and proteins to diffuse to different parts of the cell from the places where they are placed into the bilayer after production. And when a cell splits or divides, it makes sure that the membrane molecules are distributed equally across daughter cells, okay? And another point is, it enables the fusion of membranes and the mixing of their molecules under the right circumstances. So if membranes were not fluid, 
it's quite difficult to understand how cells might live, grow, and reproduce. All right? That's the lipid bilayer. Let's now break down the mosaic part of the fluid mosaic model, the membrane proteins. This is absolutely gorgeous. Most membrane proteins, or most membrane functions, I should say, are carried out by membrane proteins. Some move specific ions, nutrients, and metabolites across the lipid bilayer. One function is transport, so a protein that spans the membrane might offer a hydrophilic channel that is selective for a particular solute across the membrane. Other transport proteins change shape to carry a material from one side to the other, okay? And some of these proteins actively pump things across the membrane by hydrolyzing ATP as an energy source. An example of a membrane transporter is the sodium pump, which actively pumps sodium out of cells and potassium in. Ion channels, such as the potassium channel, which allows potassium ions to leave the cell. Other proteins serve as enzymes to catalyze certain membrane reactions. So a protein embedded into the membrane may be an enzyme with its active site exposed to substances. An example is adenylcyclase, which catalyzes the production of cyclic AMP, which is an intracellular signaling molecule. You will see this enzyme in various metabolism lectures. Or they can be receptors that sense chemical signals in the cell's environment and transmit them there, such as signal transduction. So a protein may have a binding site with a particular shape that fits the shape of a chemical messenger, for example, a hormone. And this leads to the protein changing shape and relay the message to the inside of the cell. There are also some that serve as anchors and they link intracellular actin filaments or microfilaments to extracellular matrix proteins, such as integrins, okay? Essentially, each type of cell membrane comprises a unique set of proteins that represent the membrane's specialized functions. Now, let's break down the different ways proteins can interact with a cell membrane. Many membrane proteins stretch through the bilayer with a portion of their mass on either side. These are called transmembrane proteins, and they are amphipathic, with both hydrophobic and hydrophilic areas, just like the phospholipids. The hydrophobic portions are found against the hydrophobic tails of the lipid molecules inside the bilayer. And on either side of the membrane, their hydrophilic areas are exposed to the aquatic environment. That's one way. There are some proteins that are anchored to the cytosolic half of the lipid bilayer by an amphipathic alpha helix, okay, monolayer associated. There are also some proteins that are completely outside the bilayer, either on one side or the other, and are conveniently connected to the membrane via one or more lipid groups, all right? lipid linked. And other proteins are only maintained in place by their interactions with other membrane proteins being indirectly bound to one side of the membrane or the other. All right? And there are two main groups of membrane proteins. We have integral proteins and peripheral proteins. Integral proteins penetrate the hydrophobic interior of the lipid bilayer, so they are bound to the lipid bilayer. And the vast majority are transmembrane proteins that span the membrane. Some integral proteins only extend partially into the hydrophobic interior, okay, just like these here. Whereas peripheral membrane proteins are not embedded in the lipid bilayer. They are closely linked to the surface of the membrane. These proteins can be extracted from the membrane using gentler methods that disrupt protein-to-protein -protein interactions while maintaining the integrity of the lipid bilayer. Before we end this lecture, let's take everything we've covered and label these structures. So we have some globular proteins, okay? It's hidden. <laughs> Glycoproteins, which are proteins with carbohydrates covalently attached to them. Then we have some cholesterol, which influences membrane fluidity. And this right here is a channel protein, which moves specific molecules across the lipid bilayer, okay? And we have an alpha helix protein, which is bound to the lipid bilayer. Finally, a peripheral protein, we call that they are not embedded in the lipid bilayer. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down.
To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating! <laughs>